the very latest as the King and Princess of Wales are released from hospital. Is it fair to call Edward and Sophie junior royals and why the Sussexes are caught between a rock and a hard place with their next project? This is the only show you need for the latest royal news. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and joining me to discuss all the big talking points is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, the Mail on Sunday's editor-at-large, Charlotte Griffiths, and the Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome, three of you. Good to have you. A reminder to all our viewers that if you like great royal updates every week, then make sure that you press that subscribe button and never miss another episode. Right, we'll come to Charles and Catherine's health updates in just a moment. We're with three of the senior royals still out of action, it's been a bit of a different looking week for the firm. Rebecca, coming to you first, I mean, if you want something done, bring in the women. The I mean, sisters it, are out this week. I'm telling yeah. you, it's Camilla and Anne holding the fort. They are, very much so. Um, in fact, uh, Queen Camilla, by the come the end of the week, she will have done engagement every day apart from Monday. And even on Monday, we saw her because she made a point of accompanying the king home from the hospital. Um, and she has been you know, by his side pretty much throughout. But she's been doing a huge variety of engagements, everything from, you know, opening a new cancer care centre, uh, today she's in Bath at a service at a cathedral, you know, a huge variety of stuff. And Princess Anne too, um, she's been opening everything from a charity shop in Cheshire to a riding centre for the disabled. So they've been out there really showing their worth. And actually, Princess Anne, you know, she's 73, Queen Camilla 76, uh, an age where some people might have an eye on retirement. They don't. And in fact, Princess Anne this week has announced she's appointing five new ladies in waiting and a new private secretary. So five? She's, yeah, five. But so she's... Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. This is, this is Anne who we were lauding a couple of weeks ago for carrying her own bags. Why does she need five ladies well, in waiting? Because they are... being mean? No, it's... it's I think sometimes people misunderstand the role of a lady in waiting. It, it's more like a kind of diary sect secretary and they help out on engagements in terms of making sure they speak to the right people. It's, it's almost like a PA. It sounds a bit kind of grander than it is. And, and it's only a part time thing. They're not paid. It's friends and, you know, companions. So, yeah, but she's but I think what it shows is it's a, it shows that she's not slowing down far from it. She seems to be gearing up to do even more. Do you know, what do we know about these new staff members, Richard? Um, very interesting names. I mean, they've been very, it's a very sort of poignant um, appointment, really, because Princess a Anne poignant has, appointment. <laughs> she's <laughs> a bit of a mouthful, but Princess Anne has appointed um, two former ladies-in-waiting of her mother, Queen Elizabeth. Um, one of them, Susan Rhodes, was actually with um, the late Queen at Balmoral in the days leading up to her death. Mm. Um, the other one is Elizabeth Leeming. And then there's also a great mate of um, her daughter Zara Tindall as well, Dolly Maud, um, is another lady in waiting. So she's bringing, bringing the age down a bit, but um, <laughs> it's quite fun. We did actually, I remember running a picture of Dolly at an event where she had a, a badge that said lady in waiting. And we thought, oh, have you got a new job? But it, at that time, it was just a, a jokey badge, but it has actually become um, it's, it's real come now. true. In addition to Richard, actually one of the outgoing ladies in waiting is fascinating. She's been with Princess Royal for 50 years and was actually the lady in waiting accompanying her in the car in 1974 when they tried to kidnap Princess Anne oh, from the mall. 50 years, yeah, can you imagine? Years. So is it her she, fault? <laughs> no, in fact, I'm well, kidding. you know, yeah. Princess Anne was amazing. She kind of basically said to the kidnapper, I'm not getting out of the car. Not what, are you gonna, what are you going to do yeah. about it? Imagine when um, your staff retire after 50 <laughs> years, you know, that shows the longevity. I was going to say, is she yeah. retiring and yet Princess Anne isn't? Isn't that an irony? Yeah, but exactly. Also, She's still going strong. It must speak well to Princess Anne being a, a cool boss if you can stand it for 50 years. Yeah, and I think she is. Well, we had that lovely story, didn't we, the other week about the senior member of staff that was mentioned in Robert Hardman's book that when they were standing outside the castle, she looked so distraught at the loss of her mother at Balmoral that she kind of felt like she had to give her a hug. And then Princess Anne said, well, that was lovely, but we're not going to be doing that again, are we? <laughs> oh, so it's great. Nuts. Yeah. You'd never have a sick day working for Princess Anne, would you? No, she I don't wouldn't tolerate it. She has many sick days herself, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you'd, yes, you'd be scared to make that call. Mm. <laughs> and speaking of that, Charlotte, someone who doesn't seem to have any sick days is our king. Charles is back to work. 
Yeah, Charles is working away. I think he's been hitting the phones, opening red boxes. But what he hasn't been doing is ribbon cutting and obviously turning up to events where he has to walk around a lot because presumably he's doing most of this work from a sort of sedentary position because he should be resting, really. And that's something that Camilla said a few times, hasn't she? She's always telling him to slow down. Um, but it sounds like he's he's been working away, doing what he can without actually doing the physical forward-facing job of being the king and meeting and greeting people. Mm. I try to do as much as I can from a sedentary position. <laughs> that's not really working out for me. Um, but uh, Rebecca, now obviously everybody has been very pleased to see that Charles and Catherine are out of hospital. Mm. You seem to always know exactly where they are at any given time. How, the, how are they doing? Well, both are doing pretty well from what I hear. Obviously, Catherine is back at home at Adelaide Cottage at Windsor. Um, William is still off work with her, helping her to settle back in at home. I think we could see him doing some public engagements towards the end of next week, though, I have to say. Mm. I think he'll start to go back to work once she's settled. And the King headed immediately for Clarence House, which is a London residence. And my understanding was that because he wanted to be within vicinity of the hospital just for the first few days. But after that, I suspect he'll head out to the country, maybe Windsor or Highgrove for the next you know, two or three weeks as part of his recuperation. Mm. But as Charlotte said, still carrying on working while he's doing it as much as he can. I think he might even start, once he's feeling a bit better, uh, carrying out a few audiences as well. So a few in-house meetings, maybe with the photographer present, but you know, I doubt we'll see him till the end of February mm. in public. Obviously, health comes first, family comes first, but you know, a lot of people will be missing William and Catherine in action, won't they? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, we've had essentially three out of the four most senior members of the royal family out of action until Prince William starts um, carrying out engagements again. But, you know, what? I've actually quite enjoyed really seeing um, a bit more of other members of the family because, you know, Queen Camilla um, just doesn't get that same levels of attention as any engagement carried out by William or Catherine. And so I've, I've quite enjoyed sort of following them and finding out a bit more. And the same with Prince Edward and Sophie. Um, and so, you know, they've all been working hard, but it's been a chance for us to see the wider team. Do you think, Charlotte, this does give some of the, not minor royals, but, but less prominent royals, a chance to shine on front pages? Normally the Wales is glamour knocks everything else off the news agenda, doesn't it? Yes, but I, I still don't think we're going to be seeing Princess Anne, you know, on the front page of any newspaper, because she doesn't, sadly, bring that glamour. You know, she does bring clout. And we do love, as we said earlier, the female members of the royal family. It is nice to see them, no matter what their age. And I don't want to be ageist, but, you know, when Kate comes out, it's like a catwalk. You know, she looks incredible. Readers are really interested in her fashion um, and her hair and her accessories. And you just don't, I'm afraid, get that with Sophie, I don't think. But this is why I'm going to kind of go with you, because you've made the case for Beatrice before and Eugenie. I think they're looking incredibly glamorous these days. They're, they're so well dressed, which they haven't been in the past, let's face it. Especially Beatrice looks amazing. And they're really keen to sort of get more involved. But, you know, they're not working royals. But they could bring a bit of glamour to the, you know, to the pages of our newspaper, I think. Hopefully let's get them out. Would Hopefully you, they will before too long. If you were the editor of the Mail, would you be putting it on the front page, Richard? Well, it needs to be a good story, doesn't it? I mean, you know, if, if Princess Anne um, is doing something interesting or, you know, um, but it, it, has, it has to be interesting. If she, walked, if she walked, you know, a red carpet or something, you'd put Beatrice on the front. She was looking good. Yeah, wasn't wearing definitely. a pretzel hat, preferably. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, you do want to see a bit of glamour from the royals. And that is their big problem with all of this mess, isn't it? Is that there aren't enough without Meghan and Harry. There aren't enough sort of young, glamorous royals. But soon mm. there will be, because Charlotte will grow up one day and she'll be fabulous. Obviously. Oh, don't rush her into it. it. Well, <laughs> and, and we will be here to discuss it <laughs> and envy her glamorous frames. wardrobe. Yes, exactly. Now, you read an interesting piece last week, Rebecca, commenting on the King visiting Catherine while, she, well, while they were both in hospital and, and how that's actually really quite unusual. Yeah, I did this for our um, Mail Plus subscription service and actually there was a, a lot of interest in it. because I was making the point that, of course, Charles and Catherine were, were at the same hospital together. So some people say, well, why wouldn't he visit her? But it's, it's not something the royals tend to do as a matter of course. And also, let's face it, there's not a lot of daughter-in-laws recovering from a big operation that might necessarily 
want their father-in-law coming to see them. They might want to limit the family members. So I think I, I was explaining about how I thought it was a real show of the kind of the depth of their relationship and the fact that, you know, he would make a detour, worried about his own surgery, to go and see her and that she would welcome it. And I think mm. I also mentioned in the piece that, um, I think it's worth repeating again, that you know, she hadn't had, apart from her husband and her parents, had not a lot of visitors at the hospital because they made the decision not to take the children in to see her. And yes, so, that's right. Yeah, so when she finally got out on Monday, she was being reunited with her children after two weeks, which is a long time for you know any parent to be away from their child. So, um, you know, I, I, I just thought it was really, it was, it was a good moment to just remark on the relationship between Charles and his daughter-in-law. And I think, Richard, probably after, you know, all the tumult that the royal family has seen in its relationships, a lot of people would be reassured, wouldn't they, that the core team has a lot of affection for each other? I think so, because here we're always discussing, you know, what's the royal family doing? We talk about them, you know, as if they are a firm, it's sort of business type thing. But actually, you know, it is a family. So obviously, if one is in hospital, <laughs> you know, father-in-law wants to see his, his daughter-in-law, so that's understandable and there is a real family there beneath the firm. Yeah, indeed. Well, if you are as pleased as us to see the King out and about, you might appreciate our, we think, quite hilarious montage coming up later in the show, but before that we've got lots more to come, including a big controversy over a charity connected to Prince Harry. But first, some of your comments, and once again we had so many great ones, thank you, So, and lots of you Back the Princess of Wales's right to keep details of her condition private. The artsy nurse says, as a nurse, protecting a patient's right to privacy is part of my core. My opinion about Catherine keeping her medical info private will therefore come as no surprise. I hope she doesn't feel any pressure to share anything. Good for her for protecting herself and shame to anyone who tries to get her personal info. God bless her family while she recovers. While Susan, AKA, loves a puzzle, I love a puzzle, has this to say, in our oversharing world, it is refreshing that Catherine is keeping her health issue private. We, the public, are learning a lesson about boundaries. And after Richard Kay's call for Prince Andrew to remarry Fergie, and you can watch that on last week's show if you missed it, Theresa Alder agrees. She says, Andrew should marry Sarah. It would be beneficial for their whole family. And on the same topic, Olivia from Australia, g'day Olivia, had this to say, I can relate to Fergie and Andrew, I divorced my hubby and we still live together with our teenage daughters. It's cheaper than having two properties and our kids have us both around. We haven't discussed finding other companions, but if someone would like him, they can have him. <laughs> um, yeah, I think basically you're still married, Olivia. <laughs> so, you know, I, I want to hear more about that. Also agreeing with Richard, Denise Carringer says, now I think we've heard from Denise before. Hi Denise, this time on the topic of his assessment of the Sussexes' trip to the Caribbean. I agree with Richard Kay that Harry and Meghan's odd trip to Jamaica suggests aimlessness. I would add emptiness to that description. They remind me of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor wandering around the planet, going to parties here and there and having no real purpose. It's kind of my dream. Uh, one can choose purpose, but Harry seems to have lost his grip on that at the moment. Does Harry see that the world has gone on without him, just as it did after his uncle Edward VIII gave up his royal life? It's so Shakespearean, isn't it? Richard, what do you make of that? It is interesting, isn't it? That sort of Caribbean connection. You know, we think of... You think back to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, you know, the Duke marrying his American divorcee and then ending up as, you know, governor of Bermuda to sort of keep him away from things back home. And it's, yeah, it kind of does conjure up those images. Quite unfortunate, really. I wonder what it would have been like if they'd have had Netflix back in the day. <laughs> I do think, actually, that reader was very astute, some of the comparisons that they're drawing. And I know when there were talks behind the scenes about what to do with the issue that was Harry and Meghan and their desire to withdraw. They did look at governorships or positions abroad and Harry was quite keen to maybe try and find a position in South Africa or Africa somewhere. Yeah. But I think the days of sending a member of the royal family out there to kind of permanently lord it over with someone in that position are slightly long gone and it just, the cost and the security, and they just felt it wouldn't work for them. Mm. Fascinating. Well, keep those comments coming because we do love to read them. And Charlotte, though, we're going to kick off now with a story, a shocking tale 
uh, from the pages of your paper concerning a charity that has close links to Prince Harry. Yeah, this was a really shocking story on the weekend and a brilliant story, may I say, from my sister, from your sister paper, The Men on Sunday. Um, so Africa Parks is a charity that Harry has supported for years and years and years. He now sits on the board and uh, it turns out that the it protects parks basically but the park rangers are not park rangers they're sort of an armed militia terrorizing the local indigenous population the backer and you know there were some hideous stories about a woman who got raped holding her child who was then given 1600 pounds of compensation which is basically nothing and then actually hasn't even been paid that amount in full and you know the other just really deeply shocking stories about people getting whipped and, and half drowned. I mean, just horrible, shocking stories. And I, I imagine Harry was incredibly shocked when he found out, and he did escalate it to the CEO right. of African Parks. Um, but it's just a really unfortunate association for him. And Harry has in the past spoken about um, how the people, the indigenous, the indigenous people are very central to this charity. And it's also a bit of a lesson, I think, in word salad, because Harry's spoken at length, you know, people are the, the core of this charity and local people and supporting people. And of course, actually, the, the local people weren't being supported in any way, quite the opposite. So, um, you know, he, he maybe should have done a bit more research before saying that back at the time. But of course, now he's aware of this issue. He's sort of tackled it head on and, and, and escalated it pretty swiftly. Oh, it's so grim, isn't it? And Rebecca, probably another reminder of the challenges one might face when they don't have the royal family around them to protect them. Yeah, I mean, obviously our royal family is not immune from that. We've seen over recent years in coverage, led also by the Mail on Sunday, uh, issues around the Prince's um, Foundation uh, and the whole kind of suggestion of cash for honours. So the royal family aren't immune to that sort of criticism, but by and large, there are a, a team of very experienced advisors, many who are drawn from uh, Whitehall, like the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, who, who have a lot of experience in these issues. And that I can imagine, as much as we learn about things that have gone wrong, there is so much more behind the scenes that they've managed to stop in its tracks. And I think it shows that Harry just doesn't have that level of experience um, on his side. I mean, Charlotte will correct me, but I think part of the problem was that this issue about the back of people was raised with him you know up to a year ago mm. and although he escalated it nothing seems to have been done about it and obviously questions mm. being asked whether it was an issue that he should have forced and if he had had the right people around him would they have done that mm. yeah. and Richard you've written in your newsletter this week haven't you about another big challenge facing the Sussexes yes I've been looking into what's going on at Archwell you might remember that's the um, production company which Harry and Meghan set up with great fanfare to make television programs and films. Well this week I revealed in my social diary that um, one of their key people, in fact the manager of Archwell Productions, um, Bennett Levine, has left um, and he's one of a string of members of staff over um, the last few years who've, who've left the company. And the timing's very interesting because um, next year, the um, very lucrative deal that um, Harry and Meghan signed with Netflix, thought to be worth about £80 million, comes to an end. And what's interesting is, will that deal be renewed? In fact, today it's emerged that a senior Netflix executive has been talking about the whole bunch of um, programmes which um, Harry and Meghan are meant to have lined up um, but he talked he used the phrase very early development which um, to be honest sort of sets alarm bells ringing he didn't give any details just as Megan didn't last November so forgive me if you will but I'm a bit dubious about it and you know the, the proof will be in the pudding of what what we actually see you might remember they went to Jamaica last week for the Bob Marley premiere um, as guests of the boss of Paramount, you know, a rival streaming giant to Netflix. Um, whether they renew their deal next year with Netflix or whether they sign with another um, big company, they still face that same dilemma, which I've written about in my newsletter, which is, you know, do they continue trying to make programs about other people, which they don't have experience of and which, frankly, there seems to be little interest, or do they make more programs like their pretty much tawdry 
um, reality show or docudrama, as they call it, about Harry and Meghan and give more about themselves, more royal gossip. You know, that's the dilemma that they face. Rebecca, do you think that they're spending a lot of time brainstorming and debating and arguing about what on earth they will do about their commercial plans? If I was them, I'd certainly be worried about it. I mean, they, their team have made very clear, and I think I've said this on the programme before, that they now want to end their look-back projects. But I think it's quite a kind of grand and quite presumptuous mm. <laughs> way of saying, we're, we're, you know, we're not going to handbag the royal family anymore, we're going to try and stand on our own two feet. But as, as Richard rightly says, the interest in them, I think, has been shown about the gossip and the inside story that we don't normally get that they've delivered because every other project that they've done has either been canned or, you know, Heart of Invictus, which was a very watchable program about some amazing people <coughs> and, and was well received um, as a program in itself, just doesn't attract the kind of viewing figures that, that yeah. Harry and Meghan did. So, yeah. you know, for their, for their kind of their docu-series, so it, it, they're, they're at a real crossroads in their career. Definitely. Well, let's think about some working royals now, because I want to turn to this story about the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh now. And a lot of you have been um, appreciating our coverage of them recently. Um, there's been a question come in then that I hoped Rebecca might be able to answer. It comes in from S.B. McCollum, who writes, Why does the press speak of Edward and Sophie as if they were cousins. Edward's mother was Queen Elizabeth, just the same as Charles or Anne, and they are not, quote unquote, junior royals. Now, I should point out, I had to read that about three or four times. She doesn't, he or she does not mean Edward and Sophie are themselves cousins. No, but, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see why people, and yeah. I have to stress that I have never referred to them as junior royals myself, but I get the point our viewers making is, is why are they almost treated as the kind of add-ons uh, when actually they're one of the few senior working royals that we've got now. And I think it's partly an unfortunate set of circumstances. You know, Edward is now 14th in line to the throne and is only on his way down in terms of the, yeah. of the order of succession. Uh, you know, if, if Beatrice or Eugenie go on to have uh, more children, or obviously when George and, and Charlotte and Louis, you know, in, in many years hence will, um, and which is ironic because, as I say, he's working and people who are higher up the pecking order than he, such as Duke of York, Beatrice Eugenie, aren't working. And it's just one of these very strange quirks that come with being a, a member of the royal family. And I think part of it's down to, you know, journalists such as myself. Um, we have to make a judgment call on what we think will interest our readers because there is certainly in the papers there's only a certain amount of space i think as charlotte alluded to before putting them on the front page doesn't necessarily equate to people um wanting to read about them um but you know i think what this has proved to us you know this kind of current circumstances is is maybe we should um, reassess that judgment do you think that royals like edward and sophie are particularly bothered by that perception of you know, being sort of like ranked as junior or add-on or less than or? I would say yes, actually. I think it does bother them. I mean, on the surface it doesn't. Their attitude is a bit like Princess Anne. We want to go out and good, do good work and if someone wants to write about it, cover it so much the better. But, but I know it does rankle them a, a, a little bit. Um, but then part of the problem is, without getting to the kind of workings of how these jobs work, is they don't regularly invite members of the media to cover their engagements, neither Anne nor Edward or Sophie, as I often make the point to Buckingham Palace, it, it's not very authentic to be writing stories based from a press release and pictures that have been handed out. You want to be see, there to be seeing what they're doing, to make sure you're reporting what they're doing accurately, fairly, and actually with all the, the colour that comes with it. So it's, uh, I suppose we're in a bit of a perfect storm at the moment when it mm. comes to them. Fascinating. Or imperfect storm. <laughs> uh, a quick word, Charlotte, on a story that you wrote on Sunday with question marks over whether the king was annoyed with a key person at his coronation. You are a minx, aren't you? I may have been <laughs> yeah. doing a bit of stirring there. <laughs> but there's, this, there's a, a top herald called David White, and um, one of his main jobs being a herald is to proclaim things. That's sort of his actually only job, really. And he forgot to proclaim something that was in capital letters at the Queen's funeral, which is God save the king, at the end of the funeral. And it's quite a crucial 
part, and people that mind about these things, such as other heralds, <laughs> were very gossipy last week, telling me, well, you know, he's been overlooked for, for a gong, you know, several times, and he hasn't been knighted, and everyone else has been knighted, but he hasn't been. And their speculation was, was it because he didn't say, God save the king, at the crucial moment? And we do know that King Charles does care about that kind of stuff, and he does get a bit, you know, he got a bit grumpy at his own coronation because it was all running a bit late. You know, he is a man for details. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that is the current working theory among the heralds, the gossipy heralds. Well, come on, if you're an actor and you've got one line and you forget it, you can't really <laughs> expect a, a like that. starring yeah, role Richard next has time. No patience yeah. for this. <laughs> but yeah. there is, I mean, there are examples of actually, you know, his Scottish counterpart, the exact same person in Scotland as him, did get knighted, and uh, you know, and he missed out not only at the the the, uh, the gongs that were handed out last year, but again in the New Year's gongs. And um, you know, it's kind of the conspicuous by its absence this night. I suppose it's, it's like, just high level gossip. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's that classic case, isn't it? You had one job. <laughs> you had one job exactly. <laughs> Yes. Well, I rather suspect we might be able to rankle the king a little bit right now because last week we discussed some of the extraordinary hats. Uh, worn by the then Prince Charles on a trip to the Caribbean more than 20 years ago. And a couple of you commented, suggesting that we turn some of those pictures into a montage. Thanks to the likes of Corey Davison and Britta Busa for that. We've gone one further and put together a selection of our favourite pictures of Charles wearing hats over the years. wear a hat well you've got to say that for our king along with questions and comments we always welcome your montage suggestions so please do keep them coming please leave them below and who knows you might find your dream of seeing your montage on palace confidential become a reality just time to thank my guests now rebecca charlotte and richard and to you of course for watching we will see you next week